down through the attendee list and I see a lot of good old friends along with some new faces that I would love to learn to get to know better. We continue our celebration of April as the first ever National Native Plant Appreciation Month. Oh. Virtual hike of Lacamas Prairie Natural Area Preserve led by Stephen Clark. Several years ago, Washington Native Plant Society began celebrating Native Plant Appreciation Week with various activities, plant sales, and programs. Soon the week became official with declarations signed by Governor Inslee each year. In 2020, WNPS encouraged a change in the declaration with the entire month of April designated as Native Plant Appreciation Month. This year, thanks to support by WNPS and others, the United States Senate unanimously passed a bill declaring April as National Native Plant Appreciation Month. The re resulting celebration continues. For the many webinars, hikes, plant sales, and other activities that are part of it, please type into your computer WNPS.org ORG and click on the down arrow for events. Tonight, as part of our celebration, WNPS and Sudorthia chapter proudly include a virtual walk of Lacamas Prairie Natural Area led by Stephen Clark. Stephen is a professor of biology at Clark College with degrees in environmental science, psychology, religion, and deaf education. He applies his passion for teaching to students from kindergarten through college. Often he shares his love of nature by leading bird and plant tours. Besides being a busy teacher and family man, Stephen serves on the boards of both our Sextorphia chapter and the State Washington Native Plant Society. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Clark. Stephen, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you very much. So nice of you to give me that nice introduction. Um, it's interesting, I am not even sure my students realize that my first job was in kindergarten. That was a long time ago, but yes, indeed. Um, just want to get a couple things straight. I'm hoping you can all see a picture now from my PowerPoint. Does that look right? You can see that? Okay, That's very okay. good. And then I want to, I've got some videos in here. And I don't know if the videos are very loud. And if they aren't loud enough, uh, none of them are very long. And I'll just, um, I'll recap it. So don't feel like, oh, shoot, I didn't get what he said. I'll, I'll recap it. And I'll probably say to Don, I'll say, Don, can you hear those things? Because, you know, uh, it's a handheld phone recorder. So that's kind of uh, what, uh, that's the technology that uh, I was working with. So I'm down here in Southwest Washington. Um, from where I'm sitting right now, I'm looking out a window at a, a gallery, as they say, of cottonwood trees that are going along the Columbia River. I can't see the water from here, but I can see the cottonwoods and then rising behind them, I see the foothills of Oregon. So that's where we are. And this Lacamas Prairie is a natural area preserve managed by the DNR in Department of Natural Resources, Washington. And this fellow in the middle of this picture uh, is a friend of mine. This is Carlo Abrazizi, and he's a friend to the Native Plant Society too. Uh, he's helped us in a handful of ways, but what he's doing right now is so typical. He's out on the prairie. This is a picture taken at the Lacamas Prairie, and these are students from Battleground, and um, he's just always been uh, a real good community member as far as uh, sharing things with people who are around. It looks to me like they're looking at uh, Nootka Rose. I know they're doing a survey. They're not just looking at plants. They're trying to learn some science, but he's done just a tremendous amount. The, the property, some of the property that uh, I'll be sharing with you 
uh, was cow pasture. And you know, that damages the native biota substantially. So let's give it a try and see if you can hear this first, uh, first part of what I'll be talking about. Well, that's a nice start. I don't see anything. There we go. I'm gonna interrupt right there. You hear that three, two, one? I wanna let you know right now, I'm having a good time, but I'm an amateur. And I kind of like saying that because you shouldn't have to be an expert to share something that you really like with other people, especially a group as nice as the Native Plant Society. So uh, I thank my student, Hannah, for giving me a little countdown and here we go. Uh, oh, I'm gonna, I'm actually going to make a little adjustment for the sound right now. And I think that's gonna make it a little better for you to hear. Uh, uh, Blackmas Prairie Natural Area Preserve that is uh, run by DNR and managed by Carlo. A little Adams. bit more on the volume, and Steve. Background, you can really see the prairie part of it. This is um, the a remnant prairie, wet prairie they call it, uh, and it's the same ecotype as the Willamette Valley wet prairie. And behind me now. Don, I have the volume turned all the way up. Is it still not sufficient? Because I can turn the volume down and just speak it as I go. Would that be a little better? It's better now. I think it's, let's go with it. Uh, if others all right. can't hear. If others please. can't hear, mention it in the chat. Because what I can do is I can just mute it. And they're not lo so long that I couldn't tell you exactly what I'm saying. Okay, well, I have a uh, chat that just came in that I can hear it fine. Okay, here we go. Uh, is uh, a wetland, and you're going to see ash trees and oak trees. So this is a nice place to get a sense for some of the attributes of this property. Prairie, and over here is a line of Nootka Rose, and then oak trees. And since I'm close to water, probably a fair amount of ash behind me. So that oak, ash, and prairie, and, and what makes a wet prairie is, uh, the Willamette wet prairie is uh, a very high water table thanks to a lot of clay. So the, the moisture stays up for a fairly long time uh, and, and it gives us a, a unique habitat. And it's got some wonderful, wonderful things. In fact, one of them is right here. This is Cydalcia hyterpes. So this is Cydalcia hyterpes. It's a checkered mallow. Nothing going on flower wise, but that, that's the stock from last year. So you can see it gets pretty tall. Um, Steve, Steve, I'm gonna pause here just one second. We forgot to tell them that if they have questions, they should click on the question and answer button down below, type in your question, and we will pause probably midway through and then again at the end to try to take your questions. Yeah, uh, we have, there are two places that people can make comments. One would be in chat, and that would just be, as I said, a comment. But then if you have a question, go to the Q&A, type it in, because Don will be helping me out by kind of looking at those. When I'm presenting, I don't see the questions and answers. It would be me trying to do too many things at once. So. Uh, when we stop, he'll kind of look at those and he'll pop some questions out to me. So if you have some questions, feel free. So we're in the Willamette. It sounds funny to say the Willamette, but uh, for because we think of that the Willamette Valley being in Oregon. But as far as the ecosystems go, uh, the Puget Sound has um, a wet area, the Puget Sound trough, um, and the Willamette Valley has one that goes from you know, Southern Oregon, Central Oregon, all the way up into uh, Clark County. And, and the wetlands are different. The, what makes this a wetland down here is that the water can't percolate down very far because there's clay. So this is another nice view of it. So here we have, if you can see my cursor, it looks like a wetland, but you could walk all the way across it. It's not very deep and it's gonna dry up 
in a couple of months. One of the reasons that uh, this was set up as a natural area preserve was because of this, this picture right here. This was taken by Ro Roger George. And that is, a lot of you guys are gonna know when I tell you what kind of bird that is, it's a nuthatch. But those people on the west side are gonna say, wait, isn't a nuthatch, doesn't it have sort of orange on it? This is a slender build nuthatch and it's not very common on the west side. In fact, it's a, it's a species of concern and it, it's, uh, it's almost an oak obligate, meaning it won't live where there aren't oaks or at least oaks, cottonwoods. It's a hardwood guy. And they were hoping that this, that bird would um, find good habitat and stay here. So that's one of the reasons they set this property up. And another one is the wonderful, wonderful plants that we have. And that's a, a bearded penstemon on the right. So here's what I'm gonna to do today. I'm going to share with you some plants that are from just a wonderful site. I'll share some natural history about them. As I share plants, I'm gonna have two things in mind. Um, one of them is that I think all these talks should be geared towards people who have a lot more knowledge than I do, all the way down to people who say, I know the difference between a tree and a flower. So you don't have to be an expert where you start. In fact, I myself am an amateur. I'm good at it, but I'm an amateur. And what that means is someone's gonna see this and they might type in, oh, Stephen, I think you got this one wrong. I think it's such and such. And I would say, thank you for that information. So let's think of it that way. It's an opportunity to have a community of people who at the very least like being outside and they like plants, but they might not know much about them. And then you've got people who have spent uh, years looking into plants, noticing plants, working for plants, understanding them, even advocating for them. So uh, it's, there's a great breadth and I honor all that. And then at the very end, I think it's a lot of fun to go on plant walks. I was telling my students, I teach at Clark Community College, that uh, in a normal year, we'd be going out with uh, one another in groups of 10 or 20 or 30, and you'd walk around someplace like this and talk to each other. And either virtual or in person. Some people feel like, oh, I could never do that. I think you can. So at the end, I wanna tell you uh, some of the things I do to make a presentation, even though I'm not an expert plant person, I'm just good at it, medium. Well, here is a gem. This picture was taken today, and this is beautiful doing a virtual, beauty of doing a virtual tour. You can find something today in April that it hasn't really flowered out very well. And then I go online, I found a picture of what it would look like uh, later on. Um, although I believe this is my pick, both these are happen to be mine. This is a field and what, what in canvas, you can barely see some houses out in the background, but this is a pretty big field. And this is a, a member of the carrot family uh, Bradshaw's Lomatium, and it's on the federal endangered species list, and the highest population of plants anywhere is at Lacamas Prairie. And so if you look out in this first picture on the left, you'll see these little dots of yellow, and if you were to get close, that's what you see, Bradshaw's Lomatium. Now, I'm kind of messed up on this. Carlos said there were over 100,000 plants, and I just googled it today, and uh, there was a site that said there was over a million uh, stems. So either way, the most lomation, Bradshaw's lomation is in this area. These were discovered when there was being a public walking path was being made not too far from where this picture on the left was taken. And you guys probably know him, was it Dan Gladys? Bill Gaddis. Bill Gaddis was uh, walking through there and doing a survey and he saw Bradshaw's lomation and then he saw more of them and more of them and more of them. And that is a gem. When I'm walking through the woods, this is something that everyone sees in the brushy areas of the west side. When you look at the leaves, you kind of feel like it looks a little bit like a huckleberry leaf. They're about the size of a fingerprint. Uh, in the fall or late summer, you're gonna see these uh, white berries, hence the name, snowberry. This is quite a picture though, because in this picture you see uh, the last little bit of the flower, as well as some early fruit and some late fruit. And uh, 
I've seen birds, I've seen thrush eat bees in the winter. Um, sometimes you hear people say, well, nobody eats those. That, that would be a little bit bizarre. Uh, the whole function of having a carbohydrate packed little berry is so that somebody will eat it, carry a seed somewhere and drop it off and seed dispersal. Here's something that I think is kind of cool about a uh, snowberry, a little difficult, but if everyone looks at the top right here, um, this is what you typically think of when you think of a snowberry leaf. But if you find young leaves, they'll look very different. Sometimes they can be a lot bigger. All of these were from the same plant. These are old leaf and these are newer and these are, you can tell by the uh, green, even newer. So a uh, snowberry is kind of cool in that way too. It's got, a lot of plants have some plasticity like this, but snowberry, it'll fool you when you first see it coming out of the ground if those leaves are a different shape. It's a little bit early, but here's a fringe cup just about getting ready to share its flowers. If you waited a little bit later, we've got a picture uh, from Ben Lander. I like to say our own. Um, of, but this is a gorgeous shot. Most of you will agree that um, fringe cup usually has sort of a pale flower. But here's what I like about the fringe cup. The fringe cup makes everyone be a friend of those little hand lenses. Because when you're walking down, you look at this, oh, there's a little flower. In fact, look at the blurry ones off to the left. That's what I think most people think when they walk through the woods. They think, oh, there's some flower down there. If you look close, they are exquisite. Why, they look a little bit like a cup with a fringe. It's just a beautiful little flower, but you have to look close at it. And I, I like that. Whoops. Made it's a little bit early. started my video again, which is what, not what I need to do. So we're walking down and I, you'll see on these uh, images, a lot of them say today, that was just yesterday. Uh, so it's not, it wasn't today, but uh, this was, this beautiful weather we're having, this was neat. Well, this is, I know this is a bird picture, but you'll have to agree with me that the birds are sitting on oak and the oak is a plant and made of plant people like plants. So we're still good. Here's what's fascinating about this. So Carlo Abrazizi and Roger George and um, Frank and Tom, some volunteers who are out there, they have been hoping, 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 they've been putting up bird boxes and they were hoping to get a pair of slender build nut hatches that were nesting and when we were walking on the pri property on Friday of last week, we saw for the first time a male and a female, and you can't see it right now because his butt is covering it, but he is standing right over this hole. And what she has in her mouth is nesting material. So you guys are the first group to see the first documented nesting pair of slender build nuthatch on oak trees, yay. Now, back to plants. Why are these guys um, obligates? And that's a term, like I said, where there's a, a very tight relationship between two species, but they're obligate uh, or nearly so of oak trees. I read a study that said in, in the Northwest, I'm not sure it's true everywhere, but it's a pretty good statement that there is no plant that offers more to a variety of wildlife than the oak. And think about it a little bit. You know the oak has uh, acorns, and that's a tremendous source of food for everything from humans all to bear, deer, and any omnivore will eat them. But then you've got uh, nuthatches, and nuthatches are famous for walking down a tree. In fact, you see how this guy's pointing down? Here's what a nuthatch will do if you see my cursor. They'll go down, and they're looking in all these crevices for bugs and they'll eat them. And the older the oak tree, the deeper the crevices and the deeper the crevices, the more habitat there is for bugs. So the older trees can support more birds. Here's another oak tree. And another reason this is just a wonderful plant for wildlife. If you see where my cursor is right now, a little bit hard, but those are, um, all that patterning is from beetles. 
So here's a tree that has been used extensively by beetles. And I don't say, oh no, beetles have attacked it. I say beetles have fed off of that. And then here's another thing. If I took my fingers, this was a little too high on the tree for me to reach, but if I reached my fingers right under here, there's a gap between the bark. The bark, if you look at my hands, is pulling away from the tree. And that's where bats go. They crawl up the, the tree and then they squeeze themselves in between the bark and the, and the tree and that's where they roost upside down, but I'm not able to do that little act out here on the Zoom call. So this is a great, great uh, resource to have an oak wetland. And uh, here's uh, what we see just yesterday, very early buds coming out. Um, this is a, um, a windborne pollinator. So you're not gonna see the typical uh, showy flower that's there to uh, attract uh, other pollinators. And now take a look at this video here. Once again, I like you guys hearing these people talking in the background because we're amateurs sharing something we enjoy with one another. Because I, I can use either. <laughs> so I'm just walking along and I see this and I think most of you who have been around oaks, you'll recognize this as a huge oak gall. And a gall is a word like a growth or a little tumor. And what, what has happened on this is that a wasp, a very small wasp, size of a housefly, laid some eggs on the oak tree and she has a enzyme in her eggs that bother the tree and the tree with its bother grows over them and it ends up making, this is oak tissue and on the inside will be just a little clutch of eggs. And if you look at the holes, that, sometimes those are the place where the larvae comes out. So this is from last year, you could call it a nursery. Nice job, oak trees. You want me to like a film of the sure, film? Sure, sure. I, I... So it's pretty early for a plant walk. And when you go out real early, there's some unusual things to see. And this is another thing that uh, people kind of miss. I, everyone can see on the right, we've got a pussy willow. And willows, uh, when you look at the trees that offer a lot to wildlife, willows are up there also. And willows are up there. This is something kind of interesting about the willow. This is probably a hooker's willow. I've read enough to Glacia to know that it's difficult to know which willow is which. But you notice this little yellow at the tip of all these things? That's pollen. So this is producing pollen. And yes, that's genetic material, but it's also protein. And so that's going to attract a lot of bugs. If you look at any willow tree, in the month of March or April, meaning no leaves, just pussy willows, you're gonna see bugs and flies in, in seconds. When I took this picture, I scared off a honeybee when I got the picture of this, uh, what's called a robber fly. So I just like to point this out. This is something that will, if you look at plants that humans love, you're gonna look at showy flowers. If you look at plants that bugs love, they're gonna say, oh, I gotta say, I, I like the willow. And so here's Hooker's willow. And the willow almost always makes a catkin, that's what this is, male flower, uh, before the leaves. Yet over here, and it was too high up for me to get much of an image of it, but this is the Columbia River willow. And it won't have catkins until late. It has the leaves first. So this is an unusual willow. This is much more common on the right, but at this site, uh, since it's a wetland, you're going to have a lot of uh, these plants that love water and willows are a couple of them. And we have this uh, Columbia River willow uh, down here. I guess it's in the lowlands in a lot of places, but it's a nice tree. And if it leaves out before it shows pussy willows, there's your Columbia River willow. Here's a plant that I'm guessing, I mean, it's so charismatic. In, <laughs> I know, I know what that makes me. That makes me a na native plant lover. But because how can you look at a flower and call it charismatic? But, but they're so charismatic that I imagine a lot of you have seen them, even though they are uh, rare in the state of Washington. They're uh, a state endangered plant. 
I might have the care, uh, category wrong, but I think it's state endangered. So take a look at this. I, I've got a better image in, in a minute. This is what it looks like on the ground though. And there are two things you might notice. There's spots on the leaves. And the second thing you're gonna notice is that the flower is tight against the leaves. There's something else I, I like about this particular picture. And you'll notice that a little bit like the oak, somebody's using this. Look at the petals, they're eaten away. Look at the leaves, they have holes in them. Now, if I'm a gardener, I feel like, oh, I planted something and the animals love it. In fact, in the background, I see a molehill. So the soil is pretty nice too. But this is a uh, trillium parviflorum, sometimes called the sessile trillium or the small flower trillium. Three, two, one. So here's the small flower trillium. And the small flower trillium is on the rare plant list in Washington state. The only places I've found it are in places where the soil is likely to be wet. And everyone has seen the wake robin, the Trillium ovatum, if I'm not mistaken. But this is sometimes called the Cecil Trillium because the, um, the flower is attached right down on the leaf bed, kind of like a Cecil barnacle would be attached to a rock. So that's one way you can quickly say that this is not the same as the normal Trillium we see uh, welcoming, us to, welcoming us to spring. There's another thing to look for, and that is you might have to come in a little close, uh, Kate, for this, but there's a degree of modeling on the leaves. There's some dark spots. If this was a human like me, you'd say, these are the spots associated with aging. That's kind of what it looks like here. They're just dark spots that you're gonna see on the Cecil Trillium, or sometimes called small flower Trillium, that you won't see on the others. And I see we've got a little population of them here. There's one more thing that I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 90% sure. I believe that these Trillium the, that we have here, they were uh, planted by ants because they, a lot of trilliums, I'm not sure about this one, will make a seed that has the, the growth part and then has a tasty little oily part. And the ants will grab that oily part and they'll take it down into their uh, formicary. They'll eat the oily part, then they'll discard the seed and that's what grows. So where you see a population of trillium, a lot of times you can say, that used to be where the ants lived. Tell me when you're ready. Three, two, one. So here's the small flower trillium. And the small flower trillium is on the rare plant list. Here you can see a, a close up of the trillium. I can't see the blotching very well, but I just love that picture of the trillium. And this is what I was referring to that the ants uh, plant. Now this isn't a trillium seed, but there is a thing called an eliosome. And this is where the seed is. And this is just an inducement to get the ants to haul it away and plant it. So it's kind of nice. There's a handful of uh, plants that have that, um, that symbiotic relationship with ants as the planters. And Trillium is one of those. I can see a couple of spots over here. By the way, for those of you who live close by, this plant um, grows on the Lacamas Heritage Trail. Not, not right on it, but uh, very close to it. So in this area, we're gonna see this very unusual, right under this fungus. This is ephemera macroptera, large wing. This is a fairy and it lives under this oak maize gill fungus. I know it's not a plant and we're in a plant society, but this is an unusual fungus that only grows on, seems to only grow or largely grow. I don't like saying only for anything biology, but on dead oak. And often you'll see 
a fair, not often, rarely, you'll see a fairy under it. I know it's not moving and some of you would be concerned about that, but what happens is if you have a very small body, you'll go into torpor. So my guess is that as she warms up, she'll move again. I don't want to disturb her. We'll go on to another spot. <laughs> Like, like the slender build uh, nuthatch, this was quite a find. We were quite pleased to find ephemera megoptera. Well, Don, we do, have a do we have any questions? And while we're thinking of it, we're, you guys are looking at, um, I believe sometimes this is called American rocket or American yellow rocket. I actually don't see it very often, but uh, there it is, something for you to gander at. And Don, fire away. Okay, a couple of questions came in. Uh, a couple of them are in relation to snowberry. What would cause the plasticity in those snowberries? Wow. A lot of plants have plasticity, and here's how you can tell. If you have a plant, let's say I'm a plant, and we've got sunshine on my right side, you know that these leaves are going to grow bigger and the ones on the shady side are gonna be smaller. So that's one very simple example of plasticity. I think a lot of plants do have plasticity. Ultimately, the shape of the leaves are gonna be genetically controlled, but the genetics are a combination of both genetics and nutrition. What puzzles me about the, uh, the snowberry is that it seems to be that the leaves are that shape when they're young. So here's my guess, and I bet some botanists in this group have already read about this. My guess is that the new leaves, they're, they're very good at doing photosynthesis. It's early in the season. They wanna maximize their size and get all of the photosynthesis they can as an engine. And then uh, probably a month later, that leaf will die off and you'll have more mature leaves and you'll have a larger plant, so maybe you don't need so much. That's just me thinking out loud. I'm not really positive why they have, why those leaves will fool you. Well, look at uh, poison oak. It's called diversilobum and because it is, the, the foliage is so diverse. So there are plants like that. I don't know any more than that. The second question in relation to snowberries, Generally, robins in Seattle eat snowberry in my yard when February snows cover lawns, no worms. Yeah, uh, I guess that, that wasn't right. a question, it was a comment. Yeah, well, that's right, because a robin is a member of the thrush family, and I have seen not robins, but thrush. So there's an animal that definitely eats it. And those are big birds, too. You know, we, we all know birds don't chew, you know, they can peck at things. But um, it's going to take a fairly big bird. You won't see a, a swallow uh, doing much with the snowberry, I wouldn't think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. From Melinda Raymond, I heard that yellow plant, uh, that yellow flower plant was removed from the government endangered list in the bunch the last administration dropped in the fall. Fake news, question mark? Um, I'm not up on that, but here's, here's what I, here, here's some thoughts. If you look at the range of, uh, Bradshaw's Lomatium, I believe it is found in Washington, of course, Oregon, and a few spots in California. Now, the, so, so it's not in danger of going extinct right now. It's not uh, at such low numbers. So what they, and, and also the, the another consideration is, is that the what its range always was? Because if it used to be like the grizzly bear from the Pacific Ocean all the way over to the Great Plains, the fact that you have it in Montana doesn't tell you you're out of the danger. You have a tremendous shrinking. I don't know what the original range of Bradshaw's Lomation is. I think though, with it being in so few sites uh, that it's still on the Federal Endangered Species list. That would be my guess. And I bet somebody might, I know Carla would have been able to answer that like that. And maybe someone can in the chat. 
An another anonymous question is, how many acres in the prairie and how do you get there? Oh, I think the acreage is about 1,600 acres. Um, that's for the... Do you, Don, do you remember? Do you think I'm right on that? I did. I did look that up, and unfortunately, I can't remember the answer right now. The other okay. thing uh, that I think needs to be stressed here: this is not a public trail. The, right. The area, it's a locked gate, and, and they mean it. Um, this is very sensitive land. When we were out there, Carlo was watching to make sure we thoroughly brushed our our boots. And bases that are a big concern out there. They spend a lot of time and energy uh, controlling those. And so this is a natural per preserve rather than a showpiece kind of property. Right. But here's something I would say. Yeah. Um, about a half mile away is the Lacamish Heritage Trail. And that the parking lot for that abuts that first image I showed, which was acres of uh, Bradshaw's Lomation. And as you walk along that path, there's also the small flowered prillium. The more common plants that I'm showing here, they're going to be in that same ecosystem. And that is a site open to the public, the Lacamas right. Heritage Trail. And that's in Camas. And I would just Google that and, and have a nice walk. What Washington does is they do set up some areas that they feel are, they're like a, our best example of a certain kind of habitat. And then they wanna make sure it doesn't get damaged. So they like to manage uh, the risks that are associated with it. And one of the risks of course is uh, people. But anyway, uh, there are some neat properties down here that are, are close to that. Anything else, Don? Maybe one more, and then I think I better roll. I, I think that's it for the moment. Okay, okay. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry, here's one more. What butterflies would you see on the American rocket? Shoot, I don't know. It saddens me because when I do identify butterflies, I write them down, but I don't know butterflies like I know birds, so I can't, I can't help with that, I'm sorry. So here's a plant that's uh, a little bit, I was a little bit surprised to see it. Um, this is what I call corn lily. It has a handful of uh, common names. Um, it what used to be Smilacina racemosa, uh, but I see that genus has changed now. And it, it's uh, usually see it in the shade. You're gonna see it in a more shady part of the property, but it also loves moisture. And it's a pretty big lily. This is what it looks like today on the left. And in May, it's got a real nice raceme of flowers and quite pretty, quite pretty. This is one of my favorite, uh, this is maybe the most fun or most memorable time I've ever had going out botanizing. And here's the deal. What you're seeing here on the left is, um, Penstemon hesperius, sometimes called tall bearded penstemon. And in 2011, um, Elaine Stewart works in Portland for Metro. And she was uh, doing, a, which I think she's working for the parks and she found this flower. It was one of these. And she didn't know what it was. So she went and tried to key it out. She couldn't key it out. So she talked to somebody else and then they talked to somebody else. Eventually they found it in a herbarium collection as a pressed piece. Last time it was found was 1934. This was a flower that was thought to be extinct. And she found it uh, on the Tualatin River in Oregon. And that's where it originally had been found uh, and, and pressed 90 years ago. Well, once she had found it, it got out to some of the people in the Port, uh, Portland area who were botanists, and they found a few more examples of it. What it really took was somebody who knew just enough to say, this looks unusual, and not give up on it. 
What happened in this picture of me here is taken in May of 2016. And here's a lovely story for me. We had about 20 people come to this site and we broke into three groups and we, we thought there's a good chance that this uh, Penstemon might be on this property. You go this way, you guys go that way and we'll go this way. We just kind of flipped the coin and off we went. And I went in the group that found it. So we went, we marched around, marched around and we turned a corner and bushwhacked and we found ourselves in this grove that must have had 400 plants. By far the biggest population, I like to say this, in the world. And so this picture was taken from the morning that we found that plant. Half hour later, we're all back at the cars. And you know, the first group botanist comes in. Oh, we saw some great stuff, but we didn't see any pensament. How about you guys? No, no. How about you guys? Yeah, 400 plants. So there it is. And a lovely picture by Roger George. Uh, this uh, penstemon is, uh, Carlo has found it fairly easy to transplant, and here's a new transplanting in what used to be a cow pasture on the property. So this, uh, a lovely day, a lovely day in botanizing. Here's a plant, um, the Oregon coyote thistle. This is also uh, one that's, I don't know the status of it, I'm sorry to say, but I, when I was walking around, I put a star by it. I knew it was kind of nice. This picture on the right was taken by Paul Schlichter, our own, uh, out at Sixdorfia. And, but this is what it looks like right now. This is a member of the carrot family and they call it a thistle and it looks like a succulent. So when it's young, uh, just coming up, it, it looks a little bit like uh, green onions and easy to miss. And then uh, in July, it, the leaves, everything about it is spiky. If you look at these, uh, they almost look like sepals. Uh, they have spikes and that's why they call it the thistle because it has that little attribute. A beautiful little plant and what a pleasure to have it out uh, in, in this area. Um, it's, it's not a common plant at all. This is sometimes called the bog saxifrage. Um, if you're walking somewhere that where if you would be barefoot, your feet would get kind of wet, you might be thinking it would be a nice place to find the bog saxifrage and easy to walk over it and miss it. But uh, Carlo spotted it and here it is. This is about eight inches tall, this one on the left. And some of them were much smaller. This is the biggest one we could find, but you could see the stalks coming up and it's got that, uh, fluorescence that's coming, inflorescence that's coming up. And here's another picture from Paul, beautiful image of, you can see little anthers in the carpels. So a lovely picture. I, I guess I kind of have a, a fond spot for saxifrage. This is a favorite for a lot of people. Um, I'm guessing maybe a year and a half ago, there was a real, I thought a very interesting article on the miner's lettuce. On the right is what we call miner's lettuce. And on the left is what we call Siberian uh, miner's lettuce. I was out uh, yesterday with a couple of my students. So we all picked a couple of leaves of these and ate them. Um, this is an interesting flower too, because when they're very young, you see this little gap where my cursor is? They're not completely round like the rough on a Victorian collar, but as they get older, as they mature, the leaf fills in that gap and you end up with this complete roundness right here. Very pretty, elegant little flower. You'll find prettier pictures than mine, um, but I like that. Okay, here's something for anybody who's a land manager. So here's Carlo Abrazizi and he's walking around in this area where you're gonna see corn lily and maybe some skunk cabbage. You're gonna see spirea, uh, all kinds of fringe cup on the ground. And he sees this. Well, if you're a land manager and you're in a place that you know cows used to roam, the first thing you think is that's a non-native. I'm not sure what it is, but I haven't seen it out here. It's probably an ornamental or something. I'll look it up, but then I'll dig it up and kill it because my responsibility is just to have native plants. And it turns out to be American bistort. That's something you would expect to see when you're on your way to the ski lift. This is a montane flower, montane and swampy. So what you'll, you'll see it when you're up 
at some bogs or wet areas, but it, high up, like I'm thinking five, 6,000 feet. And we've got a little population of it right down here. I, I can't explain it very well. I've got a bird friend who says, hey, the birds have wings. They'll go someplace they're not expected. That's interesting to find this plant here. But anyway, American Bistort right here at the Lacamas Prairie. Beautiful. And a real nice little, like it's, it's almost like Dr. Seuss was inspired by this little plant. Okay, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, this. One of the keys of this habitat is that it's an oak ash wetland prairie. So here I am standing with my feet in the water. And the reason I'm doing that is because of a kind of neat evolutionary uh, adaptation for a lot of these trees that are behind me, which are ash trees, Oregon. So here I am standing with my feet in the water. And the reason I'm doing that is because of a kind of neat evolutionary uh, adaptation for a lot of these trees that are behind me, which are ash trees, Oregon ash. Hard to tell, I know, with, uh, with no foliage. They have compound leaves. But the reason I'm standing in the water is because that's what they're doing. They are surviving even though their roots are down in water. That means their root, here I am, I'm a root. Their root, when it wants to do any kind of metabolism, it has to take in oxygen. There is not much because they're all in water. Most. I'm going to pause it just for a second. Can you guys hear that? Yes. Okay. Because I'm talking about ash. Most of the trees around me are ash. And I just came out of a ditch that went up to my um, shins. And I'm saying that the, the roots of these ash trees are in water right now. How do they survive it? Plants will die. It'll be like drowning them. What these guys do is they stay dormant longer than other trees do until March, April, May, the water level comes down. June, the water level is finally down enough that their roots are starting to get air from the soil. And then they'll start uh, doing more metabolism. And so these will be one of the last trees to leaf out. And that's how they survive in this real wet keep your feet wet area that other trees can't tolerate. So here's a picture from Paul Schlichter again, and this is the compound Oregon ash leaf, but look at the date, that's July. The reason these trees, if you planted a Douglas fir there, the Douglas fir would turn on its genes, it would say, okay, I'm ready to go, and within a few weeks you would have killed all the roots. The Oregon ash says, no, 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 it's winter. We stay dormant, it's winter, until July. And that's how they survive there. So it'll be a long time before you see this guy leaf out. And when they do leaf out, the water table has gone down considerably. It's a wonderful adaptation for this wonderful little plant, or not little plant, big plant. Here's something I didn't expect to see out here. Blue-eyed grass. This is Idahoense. And it doesn't look very impressive right now. This is what it looks like today. But um, this will be May. In the month of May, we'll start to see um, this, this flower. And the reason I'm taking, whenever I can, I'm looking for pictures from Rod Roger George. He is one of the volunteers who works out at that site. And he's a fine photographer. And so he has some wonderful pictures of, of some of the things that we like to see out here. So uh, when you see a picture from Roger George, there's a good chance that it came from Lacamas Natural Preserve. Here's another thing that you don't expect to find uh, down where we live, where there's, Lacamas Prairie gets over 60 inches of rain every year. And here we've got some mule's ears. Now I will grant you it's narrow leafed mule's ears, but mule's ears nonetheless. So here they are coming out it looks a little bit like burdock. If you're from our area, you say, oh, you got some burdock here. <laughs> you know, uh, nothing that special. Um, that's what it looks like today. But in another month, um, we're going to have this beautiful quietia. And, and there are several little populations of that. That's yeah, a lot of people. Are coming to that. Yeah. 
Um, I included this. I would love to know what you guys think. I don't remember. I'm sure I've seen it, but I don't remember seeing this uh, plantain leaf buttercup. Um, it's a, if you don't see the flowers, you don't, our eye didn't start off thinking that was a buttercup, but indeed it is. Uh, I know you, the ranunculus has a lot of variety, but it's a plantain leaf, that part I get, and just a beautiful little flower. And it's just, just coming out right now at Lacamas. Here's something um, pretty unusual. We only have one of it that we found. It's a big place, so I would be surprised if there weren't more than one, but that's all we found. So this is what you'll see, perhaps, uh, I'm looking at the middle picture. This is what you'll see maybe in May and June. It's a member of the adder tongue family. And what we see here, it's a fern with um, photosynthesis, photosynthetic leaves at the bottom and then a reproductive stalk going up. And if you look at the sori, they look a little bit like clusters of grapes. So that's why they call it a grape fern. And this is what we have right now just the very first unspooling of the very first coil of a leathery grape fern. So in my field notes, I'm walking along and I'm taking these little notes so I know what I'm gonna share with you. And I wrote down a uh, leathery grape fern, looks like compost because it really didn't look like anything special. It will later, but it isn't yet. Well, my friends, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I make a plant walk. Because I really do think if you have a place that you love, uh, this is sort of a every person's uh, opportunity. Find a place that you like. I think most of you who have been on Oaks, you'll recognize this as a huge. And then what I did is I got a couple of helpers, uh, uh, women who are in my class and they uh, enjoyed doing this kind of thing and they volunteered and came out. None of us are experts, but between the three of us, we had a good time. One person would film, another person would film. We'd talk about little angles. And then here's what I would do. If I were gonna lead a plant walk, uh, I guess I should have said one other thing they'll add. Learn maybe 10 or 15 plants. That's enough. That's enough to get the conversation going. And you can learn those by talking to people that you're with, uh, land managers, native plant people, I went on a walk last week with Don and five other people, and we just sort of reined in ideas about what this was, what that was, and we didn't have any trouble getting to 10 or 15. And then you've got, a, you've got enough to have a fun walk. Now, if we're gonna do it uh, virtual, ask someone to take some pictures. We don't need an expert. My granddaughter was gonna do it for me. And then here's the wonderful thing. You depend on the warm generosity of the people in the group. And that means the people here tonight, take a look at the chat. People are gonna say things that you can learn from or they'll offer some suggestions. And if you do that, you're all set for a plant walk. I think it's also fun to uh, ask another person to do it with you. How about you and me do a plant walk together? That way you don't have to feel like it's all on your shoulders. That's all I have for tonight. Uh, this is a twin berry. It's just starting to come out on the left. And this is what it's gonna look like on the right. And if you have hummingbirds, which would be Anna's and Rufus most likely, uh, they are gonna be all over this. You can see that the tube uh, tells us that the nectar way down at the bottom of the flower has probably co-evolved with something with a pretty long proboscis. So in our case, hummingbirds are prime pollinator. Well, my friends, that's what I have to share for you about the, the Lacamas Prairie. I told them I would try and be done in less than an hour, so we have some time for some questions and answers. Don, what do we have? We do have a couple other questions that came in. Sure. What butterflies would you see on the American rocket? That one, you just asked me at the middle point, and I didn't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. No, that's fine. I thought you were rubbing it in because I don't know it, Don. I'll get you for that. <laughs> okay. Uh, one other than can plants that stay dormant for a specific time account for La Nina, El Ninos, et cetera, until their favorable conditions are met? 
Yes and no. That's a great quick question. And what he's what he's getting at, or she is getting at, is this: what what causes a, a, an animal or any biota to break dormancy? And the the interesting new the, what we all know is it's seasonal, but it's not only seasonal. A lot of uh, like a lot of seeds will break dormancy partly because of the the color of light, the length of a day. Um, the amount of uh, a certain wavelength that comes in uh, in spring that wasn't there in, in the winter. So plants and animals will have a lot of environmental cues. They don't have this internal calendar that is just driven by like counting the days. They've got a little bit of that, but the other part is environmental cues. So if you've got an unusual uh, La Nino event, they won't get all the cues. So they'll hold back and they'll wait until they get more and more signals from the environment and then they'll go within limits. And that's where climate change is a big problem because they can only wait so long. There, there's a limit. Some, some organisms have great variation and some are pretty narrow. And if you've got narrow and then climate leaves you, you'll go extinct. So it's a combination of environmental cues and genetic programming, and those two have to go together. But they've, th there is enough variation to account for um, El Nino and the, and the like, yes. I believe that's all of the questions that we've got. Uh, got so lots of thank yous coming in in the chat. Uh, thank you all for your contributing your chats, and uh, we hope that you, I know I thoroughly enjoyed Stephen's talk tonight, and I learned a lot, even though he and I were out there together. I know, you're just doing it last week, that's right. <laughs> and uh, it was really fun, Stephen. Thank you so much. I want to remind everybody to look for the other events and seminar webinars and so forth that are still ongoing as part of of Native Plant Appreciation Month, the first national one, and just go uh, to, again, to WNPS.org, uh, okay? When you get that screen up, look for events and click down on that, and that will give you all of the events that we're going to have coming up. So enjoy. Don, Don if anybody in, in the chapters is getting is thinking about doing a plant walk, and uh, of course you're welcome to contact me uh, like every other Native Plant Society person, I'm happy to help out. And if you think that uh, you're on the edge of being able to do something, you can use a little advice, let me know, I'll be happy to help. Are you ready, ready to go to work full time? <laughs> I am at work full time. <laughs> Uh, here's one more question came in. Can we replicate environmental cues in labs to make plants wake up earlier? Um, yeah, and it's real tricky. One of the things they do at the Miller Seed Vault at the University of Washington is they collect seeds, especially from rare plants, and then they try and get them to germinate. And what you'll do is you'll get some grad student that will say, no one has been able to get this one germ to germinate because they didn't manipulate the freeze thaw cycle and they didn't have the slow sunlight and I got it just right and I wrote my dissertation on it. So yeah, people are using manipulations of environmental effects all the time to try and enhance what I know of uh, seed germination. Uh, some of them need smoke. Some of them need um, to be scratched by the gizzard of a bird. So. I, I'm pretty aware of uh, all the funny things you have to do to get seeds to go. And I'm sure the same thing, or, or a little bit less perhaps, uh, refers to plants that are breaking dormancy, um, not from a certain seed state, but just from last year's growth. And yeah, that kind of manipulation, people are thinking about it a lot in botany labs across America. I believe that pretty well brings us to a close for tonight's program. Thank you again, everybody. We Thank enjoyed you. your attendance. 
We hope you have a lot of fun out there on the trails in the next few weeks that are left of this Native National Native Plant Appreciation Month. I'll leave the thing open for just a couple minutes and just in case there are other comments that want to come in. We have one from Franya Bryant who thanks, uh, thanks you for encouraging amateurs to lead plant walks. Oh, great. <laughs> that's like, well, that's what I am. <laughs> and we have lots of thank yous in the chat. Yeah, and look at this. Ginny Maffitt was the Penstemon lady who found the Penstemon Hesperius at Twalton River. That's just what I mean about people sharing this stuff. Uh, my information was from a newspaper article, uh, but I do remember now uh, talk about the Penstemon lady, and I bet that was Ginny. Susan Saul tells us about the update for Bradshaw's Lamation, so that's nice to hear also. This is just what I mean. If you, if I had ch chance to read the chat as I was going, there's a plenty to learn from people sharing. I really appreciate that. If you're still there, thank you, Susan. Sherry. So I think at this point we're probably ready to. Uh, close this particular program. Again, one final time, thank you all. It's been an enjoyable evening. Thank you for your presence. And thank you, Stephen. Okay. I'm inspired. <laughs> I'm just reading what my student said at the very end. It was just lovely. So I had to make sure my wife read that one of my students gave me a nice one. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Bye, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.